Hi guys, uh, this is Amy Kohler from the DCB Greenhouse uh, coming to you guys for Green Thursdays and today we're going to talk about how to divide and transplant perennial flowers, some two very common perennial flowers and one of them is my absolute favorite and the other one is just a good gold standard great perennial and that's going to be irises and daylilies. Uh, so just the things are going to be a little different today because April, uh, who usually joins us, she's not here this afternoon. She had a little emergency she had to run to. So we have one of our lovely students, GK, over here, um, who's going to be filming a lot of this for me and some of it I'll be doing myself. Uh, so yeah, so we're going to get started. I'm going to explain a few things about perennials to you guys versus annuals um, and some of the science behind them and then show you kind of how, why, some signs to look for when you know it's time to thin out or divide your perennials and then how to do that, how to divide them and then transplant them again in a new spot. All right, so I'm just going to change you guys around so you kind of see what I'm looking at. Awesome. So this is in front of our, uh, this is part of Thatcher Hall here at Dakota College at Botno. Um, everything is coming alive, lots of green things growing and coming out of the soil. Uh, and so we'll start out just to kind of explain real quick for some of you, what's the difference between an annual and a perennial? I'm sure some of you already know, others might have heard that term used before here at, D um, you know, when you go watch a gardening show or something like that. But the biggest difference is in any type of annual plant, it's a plant that grow starts, you know, in the spring after a cold period, and then it goes through its flowering stage, and then it goes to seed and dies all in one season and it doesn't come back the next year. Um, some can reseed themselves but they're still annuals. They only live for one year. Now a perennial is any type of plant that will live for a full year and then go dormant or something or just keep continuing and come back every season. They're every season they're a perennial and a perennial can be a flower, it can be a shrub, uh, it can be a tree and a lot of times people really like using perennial flowers in their gardens and the reason people really like to use perennial flowers in their gardens is because they they're not as much hassle as an annual flower. Every year you have to you know go buy the annual flowers and you have to transplant them and all that good stuff. Whereas a perennial, you can pretty much for at least a good period of time guarantee of that plant coming back every year. And then the great thing about perennials that we'll be doing today is the is perennials repopulate. Not only do you start with one plant, most of your perennials will, especially your perennial flowers, will become bigger and you'll get more plants. You'll start out with one plant and within a couple of years, you have 20 plants. Um, and so that leads to areas of things being overcrowded and you can utilize and you can pick up and divide those perennial plants and you know take those extras and use them somewhere else in your garden, which is a great part of perennials. Downside of perennials, especially in these colder climates is here in North Dakota, um, we have things, well here across the United States and everything is we have all perennials are, are given a zone. Have you ever heard like zone three versus zone four versus zone seven? And this is the way USDA rate, the USDA on America rates the frost tolerance or cold tolerance of a plant. The lower the zone, like, um, you know, from one all the way up, the lower the zone, the more toss, frost or cold tolerant the plant can handle. The higher the zone, the least cold tolerant the plant can handle. So here in Botno, we're zone three. And that means that the perennials here can handle negative 40 degree temperatures during the winter. And then you go up to zone four, that's about negative 30 to negative 25. Zone five, you're looking more at the minimum, you know, negative 10 to 15 and so on so on all the way up to about zone 11 or 12. Um, so what do you think about it? Zone one is like Antarctica. Zone two is, you know, the northern part of Canada. Zone three here up here in Botno. Zone four is your Fargo, Bismarck and Dickinson and uh, the western, you know, the southern western part of the state. Um, most of North Dakota is somewhere between zone three and zone four. And so the lower the zones you get when it comes to your, your climate in an area means the less Usually, I hate to say it, means the less options you have of what perennial plants you can grow. I may love this butterfly bush that I used to, you know, my mom used to always grow back in Michigan, but that's a zone five or six, and there's no way that plant, I could plant it in the, sum, the summer or spring, but there's no way it's going to come back next winter. It's just too cold here. But that being said, there's still a lot of really wonderful, beautiful perennial plants that we can grow here in North Dakota. Um, and there are a lot of really great contenders. And two of those plants, as we'll get in today, are our irises and our daylilies. 
And as you can see here, I've already started digging up some, just to kind of show you guys. So irises, um, if you guys, if you're not familiar with them, they have these really beautiful fan-shaped, um, kind of fan-spiked leaves. They're long and green. Um, and then they have these these long flowers on like a stalk and then these purple, they come in purples and pinks and yellows. Um, and kind of like a beard, it looks kind of like a beard, uh, similar to a daily, a little different. Uh, just absolutely beautiful flower. And it's one of my favorite perennials. And the cool thing about irises is if they have these really great tuberous, they're called rhizome roots. So each one of these individual little cuttings of these roots or I broke off and dug up, can, I can actually get a, uh, uh, iris off of. And then the other plant we're going to talk about today is the daylily. Now I'm sure everyone's pretty calm recognizes daylilies. They're they're used everywhere. Um, they're very, very common in gardening and perennial plants. But one of the biggest reasons they're so common is these guys are really hardy. They can grow in sun. They can grow in part shade. They can grow in dry. They're really drought tolerant. They can handle salty soil. They can handle acidic soil. They're just really good overall part plants. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are like, yeah, but they just come in yellow and orange. But the cool thing about these guys is with how horticulture is going, in the greenhouse and landscaping industry they've come out with so many really beautiful colored varieties of these guys now i've seen purples i've seen almost black bright reds yellowish ones and they even have some out there that will bloom twice in one year because that's the other downside of these and these daylilies is they bloom once for a few weeks and then they're done but they have some that bloom now twice during the summer so but these are just probably your average everyday delo ray, ray yellow or orange um delaro I can't say it right, uh, daylilies that I dug up over by our Nelson Science Center. Um, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I think they're yellow. Uh, and so usually when you get them, you'll have one plant and it'll start growing. And then within a few years, <laughs> you've got something like this. Um, and we'll talk about how we would divide this and we can actually divide this guy into almost six different new plants, just this little clump that I dug up and I'll explain how that works. Uh, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is how do you know it's time to thin out or divide your, your, um, your perennials? One big indicating factor is maybe they're starting to take over a part of your garden you didn't want them there in the first place. So that's a good time to start digging some up. But other indicators could be, you know, your plants are less vigorous. Maybe you're with like irises, sometimes you'll get less blooms or you won't get as many flowers. And the really big telltale sign is what you're going to see here at soil level. So this is where our irises here are on campus and ours need some tender love and care because they are overgrown. So irises, member have these really nice um, rhizome shaped uh, uh, rootings and the great thing is these guys don't really sit much in the soil they sit right on top of the soil but if you guys can tell a really good way to sign that your your uh, irises need to be uh, need to be thinned out or divided is you'll start noticing that they start mounding over each other and they start you'll see even here right there they see how we have i have roots or mounds growing on top of each other that's not really good for the plant and probably once these guys grow up um it's still pretty early uh, i'll probably get a dead spot right there in the middle and then you'll start seeing only flowers or foliage on the outside so that tells me right there that these guys are ready to be transplanted and then another reason why we want to transplant these guys is they're starting to kind of spread out back into our, some of our shrubbery we have back here and there's no point having some in the shrubbery since they're not going to grow up anyways um so we might as well remove them and put some somewhere where they can be used so i'm going to pass this guy off the phone off to my student GK and he's gonna film me kind of showing you guys how to get these guys dug up and thinned out all right here you go GK all right awesome hey guys so I'm gonna tell you right now I am NOT where originally I was planning on April to do the digging me to do the talking and the filming and I did not wear the profit shoe wear for digging things up in the garden today I know some people are all about, oh, barefoot gardener. That's great, but that's also a way to lose a toe when you're using a, a <laughs> shovel or a spade. So do as I say, not as I do. Um, whenever you're working in the garden um, for safety reasons, so you don't lose a toe or really bang your feet up. I've done it before, not lose a toe, but I've banged my feet up a little bit. I'm um, trying to wear closed, closed toe shoes. Um, tennis shoes even are probably the best, but there will always be those diehards. But just like I said, these are not the best shoe wear, for mm -hmm. example. But, the cool thing about irises, I really don't, sometimes you need to dig them up, but right now I really don't 
need to use these too much. I'll show you. So this would be a good way. The thing about Irish is a great thing about wood chips. You'd use kind of like something like a, a fork or something along that lines just to help get that top soil or the wood chips kind of off. Um, and so I've kind of already done that over here. I've taken the wood chips back a little bit so you can see those exposed rhizomes. And honestly, I could probably use this guy to loosen, but they are so... One thing I could do is use this guy to dig around, but these guys are so overgrown, I can't even get around them. So my best bet, go grab my shovel, There's stuff on my feet, and I see this nice big patch right there that could probably get thinned out a little bit. So I'm gonna cut down around it a little and dig it up. Not too hard. These guys are pretty, the nice thing about iris and daylilies, they're pretty forgiving. You cut through one of these rhizomes, it's not going to kill them. They'll probably most likely, you have a still pretty good chance a lot of them coming back. I did cut some up a little bit too much, but you'll notice these are so overgrown. Honestly, I can just start pulling them out. And you want, when you're transplanting, you want about four to five inches long. Um, anything shorter will work, but the longer they are, the better chance they have. So I'm gonna pull some out. I've loosened them up a little bit. I want to keep some in here because I still want them to come back, you know, this spring. And then also, real quick, I have a sorry side note about irises. Best time to transplant irises is not when I'm doing them right now. The best time to transplant irises is about two weeks after they're done blooming in the late spring, early summer. Um, the cooler you region you're in, the more you can get away with transplanting them in the spring. But you, if you want irises still this year, you really want to start transplanting them before you really see any of this foliage popping up. Which right now with this year and how cold we were for a while, it's a good time to do it because I hardly had anything growing here. So they're still dormant enough that me transplanting, there's still a really good chance I'll get some foliage and flowers off these this year. Uh, but if you want to be guaranteed to make sure you'll have uh, foliage that following year, is I should have came out here about last year end of June, beginning of July, when these guys are, it depends on the year when these guys stop flowering. Give them about two weeks, let the foliage build up some energy into the root system, and then dig them up um, by fans, because these guys grow in a fan, so I dig up a fan each, and those, and then I would cut that, the, the foliage down to about eight inches, and then I would transplant them just like I'll be doing um, the way I want to. So like I said, I'll just keep going through here, pull these guys up, especially the ones that are buckling over the top here. Oh, little guy there. And, and I could keep going and really thin this out, but for time things, I have a nice little batch right here to work with. So, the great thing about these, I really don't have to divide them. They're already divided. But I could have, what I could have done if I had a big chunk in the back, I could have digged up, dug up a whole big chunk and then pulled them apart so they were about this size each. And you'll notice some of them are a bit harder. Others, they're a bit smushed. They're probably more of a dead root, but I would still transplant. You may actually still get something off of it. Uh, but yeah, so this, these are your iris roots. And then I'm gonna take these over to where our daylilies are. Let me grab my shovel, I'm gonna need that. <laughs> and we're actually gonna transplant these. We're gonna add some tri irises next to where we have some daylilies here on campus. We're gonna walk over here real quick. It's only a few feet. beautiful day today. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. I hope everyone's really enjoying the summer, the weather this year, the spring. And hopefully this weekend will be a great time to do some, this is the perfect weekend to do some perennial gardening before everything, because usually when you're gardening for perennials, and this is for perennials, perennial flowers in general, the best time to transplant is early spring before they really get going, or even better, your late, late, early fall, late summer, when they're, they're early flower, if they're flowering, you don't want to touch them. If they're done flowering, give them a week or so, and then that's the best time to transplant where you want them to go, because that will give them enough time to, you know, set and get some roots made before winter hits, then they'll go dormant, and then they'll be ready to go this next spring. But like I said, one of the nice things about being, living in North Dakota and our really long cold winters, you can get away with transplanting in the spring because nothing's really growing yet. So these are daylilies, and the great thing about daylilies is you can literally take a shovel, kind of figure out the area you want around it, that you want to pull them out, 
and do one of these numbers and just lift them right out of the soil till you get one of these. They'll be covered in soil. You wanna kinda take them on the ground, get as much of that loose soil off of them. And then you want to start pulling them apart. Real, you, you know how, you can be kinda rough with them, but you, usually they're, you know, they'll figure it out. I've got a little baby right there. So I got one, two, pull this guy apart. Another baby, I can transplant that guy. And if you're really lazy, you could just transplant the whole bunch, but then you still have them overcrowded. So, perfect. So now I have all these great babies that I could transplant. And when you're transplanting daylilies, you want to dig a hole. So for like a guy this size, you want to dig a hole in your, wherever your spot is with a trowel or your hands or whatever. Loose the soil up. You don't want to dig them too deep, but they definitely can go deeper than an iris. Loose that soil up real nice. Look at all this grass. I've already seen worms in here, guys. This is awesome. Yep. And then, dig that bottom down a little bit. Voila. I've just transplanted. But that's <laughs> not where these guys are going to go, so I'm going to pull them up real quick. But I am going to show you these irises. So we're going to put some irises in between, break up these daylilies a little bit. And the best way to do irises is never dig them too deep. So I'm going to set them. So I dug down a little bit, set these guys where I want them. Want the roots, see those roots? You want those facing down. That's perfect. Want those roots facing down. And then I'm just gonna cover them up lightly with soil, not very much. We don't want a lot, and if you have wood chips, you don't really even have to cover them with the soil, just cover them with the wood chips. And the last thing you wanna do, which I don't have out here ready for that, whenever you're transplanting, it's the same thing you're doing when you transplant your annual flowers. Is whenever you move something, when you're, say it's a house plant or whatever, and you put that plant into shock or you're tearing it apart, you want to water them afterwards. So what I would probably do once I'm done transplanting, I'd go get the hose and give these guys a really, really good soak and treat them like a baby annual. So I'd probably, that first couple months uh, before they get going or after you transplant them in the fall, I'd make sure they get watered really good and they don't dry out. Because they, even though these guys are really hardy, they're still, you put them into shock. And anything like everyone knows, you get sick, you cut your arm, you break your arm. You want to take it babied a little bit because your body is trying to adjust and they're trying to heal um, and trying to grow and, you know, use in that reserve. So the more you can create a better environment around them, the healthier they are going to be. So yeah, it can be that simple. And that's how you do a daylily and an iris. Uh, some of the, the great thing, some of the background in irises and where you can locate them, both these guys are really sun-loving plants. Um, irises can handle some shade, but they definitely handle, really like a lot of sun. Daylilies, it can go either way, but they really do well in the day, lots and lots of sun. Um, they're both pretty drought tolerant. That being said, you have to be careful with irises. A lot of the varieties that we can grow here, like zone three, they're upland irises. They are pretty drought tolerant. They don't need really wet soil. Uh, but if you're living in the warmer climates, like zone five or six, uh, irises are also a native, in some states, a native wetland plant. So there are varieties that need a lot of moisture and need a lot, and you can actually do better in a bit more of a shade, more shadier, wet environment. So you really make sure whenever you're buying perennials, um, look for that zone tag. You know, we talked about zones. You know, f Google where you live and figure out what your USDA plant zone is and make sure you buy perennials for your zone. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you go to buy perennials at Walmart, not you can't you're not guaranteed all just because you bought them in Walmart that they're all zone three here in Botno. Um, they're gonna have a lot of zone fours up there and they can get away with it because North Dakota is zone three to four. Um, but if you live here or say in the Turtle Mountains or anywhere around even up my where I live in Upham, Botno, Towner area, Rugby area, you're getting you're still on that zone three area and unless you can plant those plants in a really sheltered warm place uh, where they'll get a lot of uh, shelter during the winter, they're not going to come back the next year. And even some of your garden centers, sometimes they'll have some zone four. So look at those tags. Those tags when you buy a plant 
they tell you a lot of times they'll tell you what type of how much sun they need well, how much kind of watering requirements and then especially look at that zone or that that temperature requirement sometimes they won't put a zone on they'll say negative 30 or negative 40. if it says negative 30 that's zone four you want if you're in botno you want negative 40 that's zone four because it can get that cold all it takes is two days more than three days of it here in north dakota and a plant's not going to make it through if it's zone for, if it's only rated for negative 30 and we get like four or five days at negative 40 plus uh, and then if you do have some more sensitive ones that you want to try, say they are zone four, you're best to plant them on a south side of a building where they get some heat off that building and then the fall really mulch them like leaves, wood chips, whatever, really cover them so they get a lot of insulation. And then if you have a lot of snow that year, cover them up with snow. The more snow, the better because that's going to actually help insulate the soil there and keep those plants from really getting down to those negative, negative numbers. Uh, but yeah, that's where we're going to leave it off today. I hope everyone's going to have fun gardening this weekend. Um, I know a lot of garden centers are starting to get up and going with their annuals and perennials. It's still a little early for annuals uh, because you get that negative freezing temperature, but a lot of your perennials can still, if they're keeping them outside already, you can start transplanting now or go out in your own garden and do some transplanting as well. Also a great place to get perennials. Look for that next door neighbor or that person in town who has a ton of daylilies. <laughs> and then, trust me, they don't want to have to dig them up. And a lot of times they'll be willing to let you come take them if you'll do all the work. So that's a great way to get some free perennials with a little bit extra labor. So I'm going to say goodbye to you guys. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Enjoy this great weather and stay safe out there. Bye.